Lovely. Well, I think I'm going to go first. Very nice to see you all. I feel very uncomfortable not standing up. It seems very bizarre addressing you sitting down, but apparently it works better for the cameras. So for those I can't really see at the back, hello, uh, apologies. All right, so I've got about 20, 30 minutes to talk to you uh, about interviewing. Uh, I feel very uh, passionate about this subject. I was fortunate uh, when I applied for pupillage. I should have said I, I'm a barrister. I was qualified in 94. And back in those days, there was no portal. You could apply to as many chambers as you liked. And it meant that we did. We spent our whole first term of the BVC, as it was in those days, applying for pupillage. And we pretty much applied to every set that existed. If it had a sign outside the door, it called itself a chambers, we'd apply to it. And it meant that we had a lot of interviews and we had a lot of time to correct mistakes. And you don't really get that time. And I remember I had 30 chambers interviews for pupillage. The first 23 turned me down and the next seven all offered. And I did something differently after 23. And when I get to know you better in about 20 minutes, I'll tell you what it was. Um, but I wanted to share that, that journey with you. Uh, having been at the bar then in chambers, I was on the pupillage committee and the tenancy committee as it, as it goes and have interviewed lots of other students. Uh, and now, having a management role at BPP, I interview people for jobs. So I, I've seen both sides of the interviewing process, and there's a few things I wish I had known uh, when I started out on that journey. So the first thing to say about the interviewing situation and about communication generally, uh, as human beings, we do tend to run a lot of the ways we communicate on very automated patterns. You see a friend of yours walking towards you on the corridor, you make a quick analysis. Is this a stop and chat scenario or is this a kind of, hi, how you doing scenario? And you make quite quick decisions about kind of how we're going to behave in this situation. And some of these interactions you can do almost on autopilot. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? Great. And you carry on. Even if you're not great, the convention is you say great because saying anything else would take too long. And that's not the convention for how we're going to do things. So we fall into patterns. And interviews are a bit like that. We kind of always do them in the smartest room in chambers. We don't do them in the loos. We uh, start with a firm handshake. We all sit around a table in a very conventional kind of way. And it means that so many of these uh, exchanges are, they look very similar one to the other. We get forced into, as I say, a kind of automatic pattern of behavior. And it means it's quite difficult for individual students to stand out because everyone's playing a game. And there are sort of rules of the game. You don't come dress how you'd like to. There are expectations that you fall into. And it does tend to condense everybody into looking really quite similar. And so one of the things that you've got to be very aware of is this very difficult balance between playing the game in a conventional way but standing out from everybody else. And that, I think, is going to be a huge challenge and one that chambers struggle with uh, as much as I think candidates do. You tend to get asked, very, asked quite conventional questions, and there are very conventional answers that one can give to conventional questions, and they're not wrong, but they're horrendously cliched. So the chambers say, why do you want to be a barrister? And 98% of respondents will say something along the lines of, well, it's the twin challenge of academic rigor with the excitement of the performance and advocacy, something along those lines. And it's not wrong, but I've heard it so often, I kind of want to stab myself when the next candidate comes through. <laughs> the same cliche, but it's not wrong. So what do we do about this? Uh, and it is very tricky. So I think it, it seems in many instances a little bit like a lottery ticket. You buy it, you play the game, and you hope your number comes up. What can we do differently? It's hard to say. Um, I, I think one thing that I want to say very, very importantly, very earnestly, is, is that applying to a chambers is a little bit different, I think, from any other job interview. In that, you know, if you want to come to BPP, you want to go to Slaughter and May, you want to go to a kind of corporate entity, most of those organizations have quite a strong sense of self-identity. And what makes a bar a little bit different is you are nothing more or less than a collection of individual 
self-employed barristers. And what most barristers love is the fact they're not like everybody else. Even they're not like everybody else within chambers. And it's important to understand, I, I remember seeing this really vividly. When I did my second six, in my day you did a different, you went somewhere different for your first six and second six. And in my second six chambers, there were four of us who were uh, second six peoples, but there were another four who uh, were third six peoples. And you could tell that the second six interviewing panel had gone for a very different kind of person according to who sat on that panel than who was on the third six panel. And it means you can apply to one chambers one year and the same chambers the next year, and you might get a very different reaction because ultimately you're just speaking to three or four individuals who will react differently according to who they are and what they like. So it is, a, I don't know if that's reassuring or, or, or a bit of a catastrophe, but the reality is it's, not kind, it's very rare that chambers say we have a brand and we need to find the person who is on brand. That's not a conventional thing that you'll find in chambers. You'll get chambers who will just say we are our own glorious and amazing array of, of individuals and whoever comes into the door, in a way, I don't want another me in chambers. I want to be the only me in chambers. I want someone else in chambers who will be different from me and who will complement and complete the team of people that we have. And I think what I did wrong, I did a collection of things wrong in my first 23 interviews. And one of them was to try to be what I thought chambers wanted me to be. And that I think is really naive and isn't going to work because it's very rare that chambers have that conception. Chambers will probably look around themselves and say, do you know what, we're a bit light on X. We don't really have a, an X type of person. We probably want to recruit the opposite of what we currently have because that will give us the complete offering. So if a, cha if a solicitor's come to us with a Vietnamese case, I mean, well, we haven't got anyone who's got that kind of area. We, that, that's a weakness of ours. We, we need to try to p fill a gap rather than recruit another clone. So I think ultimately, what is really, really important is that you've got to work out for yourself what you bring and not try to work out what chambers want. Chambers want to know what you will bring. That is the equation for you. And for that, you know, being at the bar is it, a cliched thing to say, but it really is a bizarre life. And it is, you know, almost all litigation is adversarial. You will spend a lot of hours in a day with people trying to do better than you, to be better than you, to make you look wrong and them look right. And that's quite a hard life. Now, you're doing the same to them, most probably, and if you win and they lose, you feel pretty smug and it's a rather nice day. But if they do outwit you and they're better than you and you lose and the judge says you're an idiot, the other guy's great, bad luck, I'm going for them and not with you, it's pretty harsh. And what Chambers, I think, want more than anything is to know that you understand that and that there's something about the job that is really going to maintain you no matter what that is. So I remember when I first, first started interviewing as a, as a junior member of Chambers, um, I, I should say I'm a criminal practitioner. I did a little bit of family, but mainly crime. But we had a family unit within chambers and I did a bit of work with them but not much and we had we were interviewing and we kind of wanted a family person and in comes the interviewee and we said why do you want to be a barrister why family law what's your motivation very standard question really unique answer said well as a woman she said I, I did a mini pupillage and on mini pupillage uh, the person I was following did an incestual rape case and that was brilliant, and it really defined the kind of work I wanted to do. We went, interesting, what is it about incestual rape that has got you interested in the bar? And this is non-cliched. We were really, this, this, we can wake up now. This is a different answer to anything we've heard yet today. And it was a great answer. She said, well, look, the person I was following was for the local authority. And there were some kids who said they'd been abused by their father, which is, of course, horrific. And the father said, I never abused them. Their mother hates me so implacably, 
She's groomed the children to make up these allegations so that she can get rid of me out of her life forever. I am being used. These allegations are, are being used as part of her way of, of expunging me from the family forever. And she was acting for the local authority who had to decide what to do with these kids and to keep them safe. And the court had given it a week, and she had the job of working out, has this father abused these kids, or is this mother lying? And that question, you've got a week to figure out the answer, and if you get it wrong, these kids' lives are going to get ruined, and they're going to be put back into an, a, a very unsafe environment. And she said, what other job will have such an impact on the lives of children. I've got a week with a mother and a father, and I've got to look them both in the eye and figure out which of you is lying and which of you is telling the truth. And if I get it right, with the local authority, we can do our best to put this family back together again. And if I get it wrong, it's all going to be a disaster and there's going to be uh, an appalling situation for these children. And she spoke really passionately and she said, look, if, there's one, if I could do one case like that and get it right and feel that I'd made the difference and I'd been the perceptive enough to ask the right questions and to get to the right answer, if I felt I could do that once in my professional career, I would feel it all had been worth it. And we all felt rather moved. I don't want to do that. That's not my motivation at all. I'm much more shallower than that. I, I, I <laughs> wouldn't want that responsibility for a second. Uh, but it was what she wanted, and it was very convincing, and it was very plausible. And she's not a clone of me, but she, we took her into chambers as fast as we could get her in. So um, I think you've got to work out, in a really visceral, really base sense, what is it that you think you will like about this job? And for me, the majority of good candidates it will be something they've seen in mini-pupillage. They'll have lived vicariously through the uh, experience of the, who they're following, and they'll just click and go, that, that, I want to be in that case. This is the case I saw them do, I want to be doing that. There's something that the barrister is enjoying, grappling with, finding uh, really challenging or what have you, or rewarding, and I know that would work for me too. Um, and so I, I can't overstress, I think, how important many pupillages are. And to try always to think, is this something, if I was living through this experience, would this take me through the dark days and would this be really fantastic and, 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 and rewarding? And the great thing about that is when you repeat that narrative or explain to Chambers what it was about that experience, it's likely to be fairly different from everybody else. It, it'll be an individual case where something interesting or unusual happened uh, and the way they express it then is, is taking you into a conversation that Chambers will not have had with everybody else. Even better is if you've done something like FRU and in a tribunal you've actually had an experience like that with a live client of your own. Uh, and that brings me to my quirky story which I thought I shouldn't share with Chambers. My real reason wanted to be a barrister. Um, and I thought, I can't believe I, did, I thought it, but for 23 interviews, I deliberately didn't tell Chambers. And it's the fact that I myself was once a defendant in criminal proceedings. Uh, not a very bad one. I'd not been accused of anything very, very particularly bad, but there was a particular gentleman on the A4155 who did not like my driving. I overtook him. And he thought that was some terrible affront. It turned out in trial that he'd lost his son on that same piece of road uh, in a hit and run accident. And it turned out that he was driving up and down it day and night at 40 miles an hour when he should have been going 60, waiting for people to overtake him, imagining that person might have been his son's killer and taking them to court and prosecuting them privately the police had no interest, and he was bringing individual actions against young drivers on the road. So it's a bit of a tragic case, and I was one of his, his victims, one might say. So I got a knock on the door one day, and the police said, uh, there's a certain gentleman is wanting to prosecute you for 
for careless driving. And uh, the police said, we're not really very interested, but uh, we'll take a statement from you. And they did. And I went to court and it was me uh, in Henley-on-Thames Magistrates Court. And it was quite a funny case in the end. I won't trouble you with the whole story because it's going YouTube. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I got off. I was found not guilty. And for a criminal practitioner, uh, different from many other forms of practitioner, you do get a kind of verdict at the end and you win or you lose. And you need, therefore, to get a real kick out of winning. And we say to a criminal practitioner, I am competitive and I adore winning and it really, really excites me and I, I get rather excited about that. Um, they'll understand that and that will ring true. Uh, and that was a victory that I had, albeit in slightly bizarre circumstances. And Chambers, when I began to tell that story, I thought for the first 23 interviews, I can't tell Chambers that I'm a crazy driver and I can't tell Chambers I was a defendant. That, that's not pucker, that's not sort of, doesn't sound very right. And after 23 rejections, I thought, well, you know what, maybe I should just tell the, maybe I should tell the truth. Maybe that's a new campaign or strategy I'll go for now. <laughs> and they said, well, why do you want to be a barrister? And I said, well, look, I tried it out first time. I said, well, it may sound a bit odd, but I, I have actually won a criminal case. And they went, really? A criminal case? You know, you can't do that, foo-foo. I went, yeah, I was a defendant. And they went, oh, tell us more. This is now <laughs> quite interesting. And they would, you know, muck about and say, really, well, you, you hoodwinked the Henley-on-Thames magistrates, do you really think that? And, you know, we had a laugh about it, and suddenly I was different from everybody else. And as I say, seven offers in a row, which was, was great. I'm not saying it's all because of that, but I, I think I stopped trying to be what I thought they wanted me to be, and I just began to answer honestly for a change. Um, when I got into Chambers, one of the first things as a tenant that I, I hadn't really quite occurred to me, but pupils are quite expensive. And you're independent and self-employed. It depends how chambers operate. But in my day, we didn't always take pupils. Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. And if we decided to take, you know, it's in the days before email, if we decided to take some pupils, the clerks would write a little memo and stick a little slop, a little bit of paper in each of our pigeonholes. And it would say, dear, dear everybody, the pupilage committee decided they liked two pupils this year. Uh, so we've got to pay them. Can I write a cheque for 2,000 quid, please, so we can pay our pupils? And they huh? Well, I'd, oh, do I have to, really? That's, that's a bit of a blow. I'd rather hoped I might go to Paris for the weekend or do some damn thing, uh, which I can't do now because I've got to, pay a, got to pay a pupil. And so paying you, this is money that people have earned as self-employed practitioners. They're just going to give to you. It's a gift to you. And when you sit on a committee, it does rather change the way that you look at it. You think, well, uh, really? Are you worth a couple of thousand quid out of my hard-earned money? If that person, then in interview, starts trying to kid you and pretend that there's something that, I, I swear now, but I'm on camera, but uh, okay, I'll say it. Bullshit. If you think they've done a bullshit to you, you think, why would I pay you money if you're not actually prepared to tell me who you really are? I don't mind if you're not quite perfect. I'm not quite perfect. None of us are quite perfect. But the least you can do is actually be honest with me. And as, as part of my career now is to try to sniff out people who aren't being honest with me. That is kind of what lawyers do. And if you come and say, give me £2,000, and in response, I'm actually not going to tell you who I really am, it's not a great equation. So that's my next thing. You need to be straight with Chambers. I think it's going to be really unlikely that you will successfully pretend you are someone that you're not. I remember one of our first people we had apply for Chambers imagined that Chambers would love people who liked opera. So he put on his CV that he liked opera. And our policy in Chambers is first question, let them talk about something they like so we can get a sense of who they are. And in he came, so we'd identified opera. Well, if he likes opera, none of us did particularly, but if he says he likes opera, let's let him talk about it for a few minutes. So we said, what's the last opera that you saw? The guy had obviously completely forgotten he put that down. <laughs> it was a complete lie. And, we, and he went, why is it she went, uh, uh, try to think of any opera? And nothing came to mind. You know what he said? Cats. <laughs> well, why would you say that to us? 
Cats isn't really an opera. It's a fun musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber. And we now know that you lied in your application and forgot that you told us that lie. And I'm not going to give you £2,000. Why would I do that? It makes no sense whatsoever. I really don't care if you like opera or not. It was a ridiculous lie to tell us. Why would you do that? It's also unbelievably important. I know it's so tempting to think that you just need to take any pupillage at any price. And I, people will always tell you on the other side, you do need to try to go to a chambers where you'll actually fit in. Uh, being in a chambers where it's not the right fit for you is a pretty uncomfortable experience. And if you pretend you're someone that you're not and you, you, you go into a chambers where that it's not really the kind of setup that you'll thrive in, it's not a great environment and, and I, I really wouldn't recommend that you put yourself into it. So I think you need to be a little bit braver than most people typically are. A little bit more open would be my general advice. Be real. Let them see who you really are. And if you're not for them, it's probably a blessing that they pass over and, and let you go somewhere else. Good, okay, now I'm keeping a careful eye on the time. Uh, five minutes and I shall stop. Look, you know, having seen a lot of interviewing processes, as a general rule, you can be fairly clear what the main headings are going to be. Uh, I, th I imagine that most students think that the thing they want to see most is raw intelligence. And I would think that's probably third or fourth on the list. It's not bad to be very clever, but there's not many of areas, areas of law that truly, truly, truly need it. Maybe commercial work, you know, some construction cases, things like that are difficult, and the law is difficult, and the facts are very difficult. But crime isn't difficult, not intellectually. It isn't. People, you know, very occasionally something a little bit tricky pops up. But generally speaking, it's not the cleverest people that win. And I say that about personal injury, employment, most common law areas. As long as you're bright enough, you'll be fine. It's not the, it's not the be all and end all. Um, but the interview will normally try to do something to test not so much, you know, how many case names can you memorize? That kind of stuff isn't very impressive. But they'll want to think, you know, what is, your, what is the process by which you think? And, and do you pick things up quickly? Uh, and do you see the wood for the trees? That kind of analytical ability is very, very important, uh, more than just kind of raw intelligence. Um, role awareness. Do you really know what area of law you're going into? Do you really know what character traits uh, it requires? And do you, are you able to evidence them? And this is the magic really thing part about every uh, interview performance is, you know, if you want to go into family or you want to go into crime, or you want to go into property or personal injury or what have you, what do you think will make the difference? Why will the clients come back to you? Why will they connect with you? And if you think you have a characteristic that's very likable or very impressive or something like that, how do you show Chambers that you have that skill within you? You know, did you do a year off? Did you go and live with a Muslim family and build wells? I don't know. Um, at university, were you social secretary? Why did other people trust you? Why have other people liked you? Why have other people warmed to you? What have you done to show that you've had responsibility, that you've been in difficult situations and come through it with a clear head? And we had someone come to Chambers and say they diffused an argument on a bus where someone was arguing with the driver and was about to break into a fight and they stood up and, and, and mediated that. And that's actually a really important skill set. Mediation is massive. Being able to bring warring sides together and calm and soothe and reconcile, that's really important. And it was a nice example, quirky example, but a nice example. And Chambers went, well, that's an aptitude. Um, so, yes, try to think. You might have to bury, depending on what you've done in your life so far, be creative and dig around in your life to think what it is that you've been through or seen uh, that's given you these, these, these sorts of skills that might translate into something important for the bar. Um, the other thing to be <laughs> aware of is that in many uh, Chambers interviews, the person who's lined up to be the next pupil supervisor might very well be in the room. 
you're, and it's a very intimate relationship between pupil and pupil supervisor. Uh, I remember the first friend of mine who, who now is Silk, who, who took a pupil, is the first of our, our group of friends at uni to do so. And we were all quite curious to know how his kind of first week had gone. So we went for a drink. We said, Justin, how is it like to have a pupil? It's the first, as I say, one of us who'd had one. And he went, oh, God, he's really hard work. I went, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I, I made this application. And I, I'd done a lot of work, and I, I thought I'd done quite well. And my pupil was in there frantically making notes while I was speaking, and I, I felt that was a bit off-putting. And then afterwards, I said, how, how, did, how did you think it went? And my pupil went, well, I've got a lot of questions. I've got to say that. And uh, he felt rather undermined by his people. He felt his people was being rather judgmental and was making him feel rather insecure. Um, and it's important to understand that Chambers will be looking at you, and if nothing else, they'll be assessing, am I prepared to sp share space with this person? Many pupils become very close friends with their pupil supervisor. Uh, I went to a, my, my first six was at a family, said they didn't want to do family, they wanted to do crime. And when I applied to them, they did mainly crime, but some family, and then by the time I arrived, there'd been a chamber split and all the criminal people had left, so I got stuck in a chamber I didn't really want to be at. Uh, but, but, I had this fabulous pupil supervisor, and we live a street away, and, and we're, we're really, really close friends uh, 18 years on. Uh, so they will be looking at you and thinking, am I prepared to share space with that, that person? It, it, it comes down a lot to simple likability. Um, and the last thing I'd say is, is look, you know, pupils don't make a chambers. Chambers don't put on their website, we have fantastic pupils, therefore send us work. You know, you're, you're not, you're not going to change their, you're not going to become on the sort of legal 500 best set in the world because their pupils are quite clever this year. You're, you're not going to do that. But if a pupil starts trying to be too clever and take work from members of chambers to look after a small hearing and then start trying to change the direction of the trial, and you can cause a lot of problems. You can do a lot more damage than you can do good. And so I think I would be sensitive and respectful for the fact that chambers are investing in you. They're giving you work. You're not bringing it for yourself. All the work you get to start off will be other members of chambers' work. And ultimately, they want someone who'll be careful who will be steady, who will be sensitive, who will be industrious, uh, but will know that they're on a learning journey. They're not there in, in that moment to kind of cure the world. So those skills and that kind of approach to the work is important, I think, to demonstrate.